Ever since my video on Fallout 4, a percentage of people out there have been upset with me. Uh, I talked about uh, polyamory in that video. I talked about not being straight in that video. And I talked about how those things relate to yours truly. And in response, some people have called me a degenerate for this. Uh, one wonders why they chose now to clue into the fact that some degeneracy may be going on. I mean, the pog fucking didn't give it away. But anyway, uh, the point is, I just want to address that and say that any degeneracy on my part uh, uh, for any kind of polyamorous behavior is not my fault. Have you any idea what it's like to be this irresistible to men and women alike? Have you any idea what it's like to be the most desirable, the most delectable man in games media? No, you don't, because you're not me. What I do, I do for the good of society. There has to be enough sterling to go around. It's at this point that you can make a fat joke and say, well, there's plenty of sterling to go around, we can see it. But the point is, it's that I give of myself to the human race. Anybody who wants a bit comes and gets a bit. Because otherwise there'd be anarchy, chaos. Imagine a world where you can't bang Jim Sterling. Ugh. That's not a world I want to be a part of. Kotaku has kickstarted a bit of a controversy lately by opening up about two instances of blacklisting. In an article titled A Price of Games Journalism, which sounds like a really bad George R. R. Martin book, Stephen Totillo revealed that Bethesda has refused to deal with the outlet for two years, ever since it published bits of a leaked script for Fallout 4, and Ubisoft had done the same following the leaked details of what would eventually be called Assassin's Creed Syndicate. The concept of the publisher blacklist has been around for a long time, and generally been considered a bad thing by everyone except the publishers doing it. Threatening the revocation of access, review copies, press invites, etc. If games media doesn't toe the line is a damn stifling thing to do. However, in this case, the issue has been less cut and dry because Kotaku didn't just say something a company didn't like, it outright leaked a script and, and revealed something that obviously Bethesda wanted to keep as a surprise. Now, does Bethesda have a right to be pissed that Kotaku leaked the script of its game ahead of time? Well, if someone leaked something I'd been working on, I'd probably be pissed. I'd probably never want to talk to them again either. Now we can talk all day about the rights and wrongs of Kotaku, Lord knows I've heavily criticised the site myself in the past, and I think its parent company Gawker is the online equivalent of a screaming pile of living liquid shit. So let's divorce Kotaku from the discussion so that we can talk about blacklisting itself and have an actual conversation about it, and how it ties into the discomforting attitude that the media and the games companies should have a servant-master relationship. The threat of blacklisting is, in most cases, a bad thing for games media. Half the reason it's bad is due to the media itself, but we'll get to that. In an entertainment medium so tightly controlled by marketing executives, the ability to do any real journalism is already pathetically small. Maybe 1% of all games media out there could be considered actual journalism. And no, I by no means think I'm part of that 1%. It's alarming then, when those rare glimmers of honesty and diligence are swiftly punished in an attempt to make sure it never happens again, or if it's outright shut down. Fact of the matter is, several publishers feel like they're entitled to control the message on every single level. And we've seen that in cases like the GameSpot and Jeff Gerstmann controversy, where advertising was pulled and a man lost his job over publishing a low-scoring review. The fact I remain blacklisted by Konami for criticising the company and giving some of its games low review scores is pretty well known too, while sites like Videogamer.com and Destructoid have all been given the silent treatment by a variety of publishers over the years, usually just for saying something they didn't like. It's petty, and it's petulant, and it speaks volumes about how those companies view themselves as deserving only of positive, pre-approved press. Now, a great example of this entitlement complex can be found in Super Bunny Hop's recent tussle with Konami, where a video was published revealing some interesting information regarding Hideo Kojima's controversial departure rumours, and Konami's response was to hit that video with a takedown strike and have it censored from YouTube. Activision has done the same thing with videos showing glitches in Call of Duty games, attempts at journalism attempts to expose an inconvenient truth get punched down. Publishers expect all forms of media to only say the things they want said, only show the things they want shown when they want them to be shown, and deviation from the company script can get an outlet punished. That's pretty shitty, and anybody who cares about integrity ought to at least be concerned about it. This is not to say the press is entitled to access, or indeed that all revocations of access are entirely bad. 
A publisher has a right to blacklist anybody it wants. I mean, frankly, I'm shocked more companies haven't blacklisted me. No outlet is owed access, no journalist or pundit has a right to a press pass, and no critic is obliged to receive a review copy of a game. However, by the same token, publishers aren't owed obedience, and outlets have an absolute right to publicly reveal when they've been blacklisted, to name and shame where applicable, and let the public decide if justice or injustice was done in that case. If anything, doing so can sometimes be the only way to get a company to actually talk to you again. A little public whining can get some positive results, squeaky wheels and grease, etc. The power of the blacklist is not all the fault of game publishers, though. The reason it has so much power is because media ascribed so much to it in the first place. We'd have a better games media overall if blacklisting wasn't treated as a scary prospect. Some media outlets are outright terrified of losing access, of not getting review copies, of not getting to go to review events, of losing their ability to get press releases. Some outlets, like the aforementioned Video Gamer, consider blacklisting a mere cost of doing business and find other ways to get their content out there. It's the right attitude to have, I think, an attitude that removes the teeth of companies when they try and swing their dick around. Their, their toothy dick. I kind of mix the metaphors there. If you're a good outlet, you don't need access to keep your audience. You should be doing something original and unique anyway. Access should be a bonus, and if you lose it, it should at worst be an inconvenience. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If your publication relies on access to survive, then you haven't got a product worth preserving. You're just a regurgitator at that point. Find a way to live without publishers feeding you table scraps. Once you render a blacklist meaningless, you'll find yourself a lot better off, and you'll find yourself with a lot more power. Like a representative from Sega once told me, there's no point in blacklisting you, you just buy our games and shit on them that way. And that's an attitude I can respect. Now this is not to say games media should just be outright dicks about things. If you've agreed to an NDA and you break it, or if you betray the trust and confidence of a developer in some way, if they told you something in secret and trusted you and you go ahead and spread it, well then you're being a total shit, and I don't expect many people to crack out the violins for you. But if you think blacklisting is just deserved, for simply giving a game a negative review or revealing a bit of information you never agreed to keep secret, you're actively contributing to a worse media overall. That attitude has led to an industry of game companies who believe they're owed subservience, who view games media as just another PR department, and too many members of that media are happy to play the role of a glorified pitcher. You want an example of that belief? Well, look no further than renowned charlatan Randy Pitchford. See, Gearbox and 2K Games once brokered an exclusive exclusivity deal with Game Informer where the magazine would get to be the sole privileged outlet to reveal Borderlands 2, you know, as Game Informer gets to be in most cases. Only trouble is, Eurogamer found out about the game before the magazine got to make the announcement, and it did what any savvy outlet would do. It didn't keep it to itself, it published the fucking hell out of those details. Gearbox CEO Randy Pitchford's incensed response was to attack Eurogamer and accuse it of, and I quote, shoddy journalism. Yes, Eurogamer were the bad journalists for knowing information and not choosing to withhold that information so another outlet could be part of an exclusively brokered marketing campaign. They were the bad guys for not obeying an NDA that they never signed, for not sticking to the terms of an embargo they never agreed to. In Pitchford's world, the ethical thing to do would have been to keep silent and let the PR machine work as scheduled. And that's what a lot of the games industry thinks is the ethical thing to do. Shut up and wait for the press release and parrot the publisher's words verbatim. Let the outlets who have brokered deals get their exclusives and parrot the news when it breaks at the preordained time. Read the review guides and gawk at the graphics and parrot the review scores expected by the hype train. As a guy on a couple of blacklists himself, and one who generally finds the blacklisting hilarious, I'm obviously a biased party in the discussion, especially as my experience of getting blacklisted have come from some certain executives being petty, whiny, spoiled little infants. I doubt anybody's surprised I'm a them. Still, it's worth reminding everyone that regardless of what you may think of any one outlet, any one press member, the way publishers seek to control information to a near megalomaniacal degree needs to be called out. I don't blame PR for doing what PR does, but there are times when it oversteps its bounds, and those times require a good smacking down. Publishers and media don't really need each other when you look at it, but they're generally pretty good at getting along. That's convenient for them, and it's good for the audience, but that's really where the 
relationship needs to begin and end, a mutually convenient situation. Once it gets treated as more sacred than that, we get vengeful companies trying to act like dicks and media lackeys trying to keep them happy. And as for the viewers out there, do not be tempted to cheer for blacklisting just because you don't like the outlet that's been blacklisted. We can talk about the rights and wrongs of specific situations, and there's plenty of interesting debate to be had there, but the gloating is tacky. And I'm not just talking about Kotaku here, I've witnessed communities gloating at the idea of myself being blacklisted just because they don't like me. If it happens to a big outlet like Kotaku, you can bet your ass it happens to smaller underdogs, and disappointingly regularly too, for far pettier reasons. And to publishers, just remember, blacklisting never silences an outlet, and sure as fuck doesn't guarantee they'll start being nice to you. Just ask Konami. Hit the lever. Just a brief bit of fuck Konami news for you, all the news that's fit to make you say fuck Konami. Uh, this is old news, but old news is still news, I just never got around to covering it. But basically, Konami have trademarked the idea of a big boss pachinko machine. So don't you worry folks, Metal Gear Solid Pachinko is a coming, like we all could have predicted that it would. What, you didn't make enough money fucking taxing people and taking their resources and putting them in the Ford Operating Base online component, even if they wanted to play the game offline, which is the best way to play Metal Gear Solid 5, just so that you could try and force people into the online mode, so that you can nickel and dime them with microtransactions and offer them base insurance. Is that not enough money for you, Konami? No, of course it isn't. Let's pachinko it up. So expect that, expect another, uh, another mockery of a once respected series coming to a pachinko house near you. Fuck Konami! Oh, and thank God for me. And I'm getting this, I'm, I'm replacing this lectern. This is bullshit. Brief Overkill update before we sign off. Uh, Overkill software, of course, upsetting people with microtransactions in Payday 2 that got worse and worse. People haven't been happy about it. People have complained about it. And in response, Overkill has apologized. Yes, Overkill recently apologized, said that they're sorry for, for, for all the upset they've caused and they're gonna work on fixing it. So that's good. Uh, as someone who watches other members of the media and industry passively, aggressively making fun of him for complaining about microtransactions, seeing people uh, uh, talk about how we shouldn't complain about this stuff because it's inevitable and that whining on the internet doesn't fix anything, it's nice to see that whining on the internet fixes something. Like I've always said, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Sometimes it won't work, sometimes it will, and when it will, halle bloody ululia. So that's good. Good news, nice bit of progress. We'll see how Overkill handles it from here, but there we go. Like I said in my episode about uh, uh, enjoy the silence, feel the noise. It's good to make a noise sometimes. So keep making that noise. Sometimes it works. See ya. Here's a TV that looks like an apple.